Thank you so much for joining us. I've got Wayne with me today. We're teaming back up again after some time apart, and we're going to be talking about process intelligence. Before I get into the questions that I have for you, Wayne, can you give everybody an introduction? I can. Um, so let me start. So I'm now the most British person in Texas. Uh, so when we last spoke, Emma, I was almost an exact same background, but about 4,570 miles away back in the UK. So I'm now now in Southlake. Uh, role is still very much the same. I work for ISG Automation. Uh, I am uh, a bit of a jack of all trades, and anything and everything to do with the world of RPA, intelligent automation and hyper automation. My official title really is Global uh, Head of Intelligent Automation Solutions. But as you know, and hopefully as most of the audience know already, uh, I uh, speak about this topic um, on a regular, regular basis. I'm incredibly passionate about the role of technology in making work more efficient. I love how precise you were in the distance that your office furniture has traveled. <laughs> and I can, I, let, let me try and think about why I know that. Oh, um, because my one of my favorites is my old home when I go to Google Maps and the new home. So when, regardless when I'm here, I can literally go to Google Maps, look at favorites, and it actually tells you how far away you are. So it says 4,000 and odd, and odd miles. So I, I know exactly how far I am from my UK home at any given point. There we go. Well, let's get it down to kind of just an introductory question for anyone that might be joining us that doesn't live and breathe this industry the way that we do. Can you give them a definition of what process intelligence looks like from your perspective? Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, this is, this is an, an area that I spent probably the last 12 months really starting to understand the value of um, so process intelligence really is starting to look at your processes through the lens of data, uh, both historically, but also uh, moving forward so that you start to understand your processes in, the, in a different light. Um, and, you know, we can talk about, you know, how we currently understand our processes or, or most organizations understand their processes. But basically, it's looking at the systems, it's looking at the actions completed, and it's using a technology to help make sense of that, make sense of that data and provide you with insight um, and the type of tools that you might be kind of uh, thinking about in this world are, are, are those that are uh, interested in task mining, process mining, conversations mining, process intelligence. There's an ecosystem of, of tools uh, and their sole purpose is to provide insight from your process data. Um, and, um, and, you know, so that's kind of a, a bit of a, a bit of an overview, I guess, of the, of what process intelligence is. The key thing is it's a incremental capability to the knowledge that your knowledge workers already have. Great. So I want to dive into, you know, you mentioned this idea of, we might dive into how people are managing their discovery processes today. And that's typically with conversation and consulting. Um, can you help us understand how bringing in data, whether that's task or process mining or conversation mining into our discovery process can help us start to eliminate maybe some of the biases that we would have otherwise? Mm -hmm. So um, it's probably a term, the bias term as part of process discovery, I think is, is still um, reasonably uh, not well, not well defined, not well known. Um, but what process mining, process intelligence has kind of uncovered, at least for me, the insight it has given me is that what we think we do, what our workers think they do, and it's not just the what, but it's the when, uh, it's the how frequently, uh, it's how long it takes. All of that is a point in time guess, generally. And the thing about our work within process discovery is that we often spend we, we bring in the SME. That SME has not done the work for three months. They've done it for the last five years, right? And so when they're thinking about the work that they complete, they're not looking at, they're probably looking at a specific point in time rather than the now, the average, the mean. And so when they're providing us with insights, it is obviously for them incredibly accurate. 
the reality is it is in, it's biased it's biased data based on a point in time during their time doing this work um, and what process intelligence has given us is allowing us to cut through the when do you do it how long did it take um how long you know how how, how long uh, is that that process run for within your organization at what points in the month it's taken away all of the information that we can gather from data and it's allowing the people to just concentrate on tell us why you do that and how you do it so the why and the how is what the people the value that our employees can bring and let's do the what uh the the when uh you know a task and a process level let's leave that down to process intelligence now that's important when we think about what we're doing as part of process discovery. I think it's also equally important as we start to think about the future and any change that we make and how it impacts the work that we do. Because we're very good at making change. I don't think we're particularly very good at truly understanding the impact of the change, at least at a data level. We might be able to update a process flow doesn't really give us the type of insight that we need as to what has been the impact. And that, to me, is one of the big failings, I would say, so far in this world of intelligent process automation. Um, we've made loads of change. I don't think a lot of organizations have seen significant impact that they've been able to prove out so far. I think that piece of downstream impacts is so important because how many times have we heard those stories of someone coming in, automating a process that, yes, was repetitive and, and manual and needed to be, you know, ha have some sort of relief too, but all of a sudden now you're just burying someone down the line and even more work and you've created a different bottleneck or a different problem for your organization. So really being able to see that full end to end journey of your process and start to make those holistic adjustments mm -hmm. is, is such a huge part to me. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the one thing to add to that is, you know, with the greatest will in the world, um, and I know there are people who may doubt this and have a very different opinion, we are not going to automate our work. Uh, intelligent automation is not going to automate the vast majority of stuff that we do, at least in the way that it's designed at the moment. However, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be tracking it at a data level. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't have intelligence around those processes, even when we don't automate them. And so this is far wider than intelligent automation. This is about turning your organization uh, into a, a, you know, a Fitbit type capability that enables you to track the health of your business through process. Like that's what process intelligence enables for me. Uh, and that is so much more than just you know, intelligent automation. Anyone that may have been watching me instead of you while you were saying that is going to see that I got this little smirk on my face when you brought up the fifth analogy, because I'm such a like analogy person. And I think that's so incredible for helping people understand. But that right there, whether it's a Fitbit or Apple Watch or whatever, but using it to track your health and it's not doesn't necessarily if you don't do anything with the data, it doesn't do anything for your organization, but at least that constant monitoring. Mo monitoring can be a part of your process. So I want to jump now that we've kind of talked through what the value of it is for an organization, that high level definition. Let's dive into some customer examples and maybe where you've seen um, process intelligence really move the needle for one mm -hmm. of your customers. Um, let me try and think. Let me, let's think three, but three, not five, three. <laughs> uh, three different examples, right? And, and, and they're going to, they're going to, convey a different tool set right so i'll think about three three particular uh tool sets so the first one let's go with um uh pro process mine is probably you know the, the one, one of the three um so process mining um really where where i think this adds the most value is elongated processes that um cover multiple different teams uh, in multiple different micro tasks that create an end-to-end -end process. Um, so let's look at claims. Claims is a brilliant example. So an insurance client uh, who has an elongated claims process, um, uh, they automated what they thought was their claims uh, process. And in the end, 
they realized that the 70% levels of automation that they thought that they would uh, receive was something like 20%. So it's significantly undervalued. And they were like, Wayne, something's amiss here. We think we've automated the process and you know, we're not seeing the, and the value. So he said, okay, well, let's look at process mining then. Let's really understand not what your SMEs are saying happens, but let's understand the underlying data associated with your claims. And the reason why we can use process mining in this instance, because you have one unique identifier, that claims reference number in theory flows through your system and your process. Very similar to, um, to an account number, uh, a cell phone number, you know, usually that's the type of unique identifier that you're really interested in. It allows you to track a customer through a journey from end to end. And what we what did we see? Um, so we, we basically looked at the last two years worth of claims data and very quickly we saw the reason why their automation had failed to yield the value that they wanted to create. There were 2000 different variations of a claim running through their system and their process. 2000. Uh, they thought they only had 10. So they automated a large proportion uh, or a decent spread of the 10 because that's what their agents had told them. This is what we do. This is how we do it. Okay, great. We've documented that and we've automated it. Um, it's actually 2,000. Now, a lot of those variations, you know, you might have only got 2, 5, 10, 20, 50 um, of them a year. But when you time multiply that by the fact that there's over a thousand of them that they didn't even think about, there's you know there's another nine hundred that you know again they hadn't really thought about, and then there's a hundred of stuff where you know if they really dug into it, they probably could have got to that level of variation. That was a brilliant example of why process mining is uh, is inherently valuable, even if you've already automated the process to show you the downstream impacts of that, and also why you may be not able to achieve the value. Second one is task mining. Uh, in this instance, uh, another another this financial services client in this instance, uh, and we basically put technology on their desktop and monitor what it is that they're doing, the clicks that they're making, the types of micro tasks that they're completing. It then gets spit out into a machine learning model. That model then provides us with output, and basically that output can then be sliced and diced in different means. So again, I go back to the process bias bit, and I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to be quick. I'm trying to try and be quick, but very insightful. Process bias told us that they completed task one within two days post month end, and it only took them two days. Okay, the first thing that task mining told told us was that nine days after month end, they were still completing the process that they told us they did in two days at the end of two days after every month. So, so their understanding of that. So what they did was the same, but the time it took them was nearly five times X. Okay, that is insight that we would not have gained from a person. Another example where they say, we get this thing every day and we monitored them for 30 days and we never received one. Okay, so again, process bias. Are they lying? Not intentionally, but the technology tells us the reality where, where the agent is unable. And the final one is conversation mining. Again, another technology, I would say, part of this entire suite. Um, we took a client and took 150,000 emails that they had had between them and their clients, uh, between internal teams, uh, or across a number of inboxes. And we were able to, at that point, provide them insights like the average number of people that are on these emails uh, that never do anything other than receive the email is something like 60%, like 60% of people who are on CC have no real need to get these emails into their inbox. We are wasting, they're wasting time even having to delete these. We need to rethink that. Um, we were able to understand that 25% of all emails received were pretty much received, forwarded, forwarded again, and then forwarded to an endpoint. Okay, that is huge waste. No one is gonna tell you that. No one individual is ever gonna say, I get this email and all I do is forward it. And then we speak to somebody else and all I do is forward it. Like there are fundamental gaps within email processes that you just can't necessarily see with process or task mining because Outlook is not brilliant at reporting. We all kind of know that. Um, and so, you know, these, these different tools have got different uses, um, but they're all incredibly important. They're actually very complementary, but it always depends on the type of business you are and the type of problem you're looking to solve as to which of these process intelligence tools is going to be best fit for you. So I think that's probably 
three separate examples, Emma, across these three different technologies. Um, so hopefully that's kind of helpful as to, uh, as to start positioning this at least. I would say you were very concise and very insightful. Even if I can't talk and you can't count, I'm hoping somebody has learned something through our conversation today. Um, but I want to thank you for taking the time to sit down with me, Wayne, and share a little bit of your wisdom with the, the world. And I want to encourage anybody who's watching to make sure that they make their way over to your LinkedIn, follow you. You've got a lot of great content that's coming out. And as a little teaser, we're going to be teaming up again for a third Thursday coming in December. So more to come from this duo along with a lot of other friends. Um, but thank you very much, Wayne, and have a wonderful day, everyone. Well, thank you, Emma. Thank you, everybody. Always great to speak to you. And uh, yeah, feel free to, to, to reach out to me uh, direct if needed. If you're looking for expert tips on how to get started with your transformation or looking to hone in on your approach, make sure that you subscribe to our channel to catch our weekly digital transformation talk series where we interview experts from around the world on how to make it happen.